So I'm Michael Lizard, uh, as I introduced myself before. I, I forgot, I should have said the, my uh, interesting factoid is I am actually a computer vision researcher who turned into a systems researcher more recently. So any of you want to do computer vision <coughs> projects, uh, I'm sure I can be very helpful on that. Anyway, uh, so now that Yuan has introduced uh, the syntax of Link, uh, most of this talk is going to be describing how the system actually generates uh, parallelism from these, uh, from these high-level programs that get written in Link. And then towards the end, I'll say a little bit about how the system actually executes these programs on the cluster. Um, and then I'll, I'll set up a bit of preparation for the, uh, uh, the practical that's going to come afterwards. So, uh, so some basics for distributed computation, the kind of problems that we're going to have compared to what you get um, with a, a single computer with shared memory. So traditionally, when you write your, your single computer programs, uh, most people use a shared memory model. And all of the objects are always available for all of the threads to read and write. Um, concurrently. And if you try and distribute this onto a cluster of workstations, uh, it's very expensive. I mean, you, you could, in principle, try to broadcast a copy of all of the objects to all of the computers um, and keep them all in sync. But um, that would be expensive. It would uh, waste a lot of memory. Um, and really, you would prefer to have each of the computers only seeing a subset of the objects. Um, and then if, if one of them modifies one of those, you're going to have to explicitly share that with the people that need to know about the modification. Um, and so it's possible to program that kind of thing by hand, but it gets very tedious. And so the goal of Dryad Link is to handle all of that distribution into subsets of objects and communicating the, the things that need to be communicated between the different parts automatically uh, without the programmer having to deal with it. Uh, and it still needs a little bit of help. And that's, that's why you have to write in Link instead of just writing your loop-based code and, and hoping that the system can figure out what you meant. Um, the idea is that the higher level abstraction of Link will, will help the system know what you actually wanted to do instead of a particular recipe for doing it um, that you thought was going to be a good idea. So as you've seen, Link is a fairly high level declarative specification. Um, and it tells, it, it tells the system, I want to do this action on an entire set of objects. Um, so uh, here are some of the ones that I'm going to be talking about. In particular, I'm not going to go into details on all of the operators that you undescribed. Um, but hopefully, it will be possible to, to, for you to infer how some of the other ones work based on, based on these. <coughs> uh, so the, the basics, OK, suppose you have this cluster of computers, and set is one of these link connections. So it's not an array in memory anymore. It's some set of objects that's been distributed over the cluster. Um, and in particular, we're going to store it on the local disks of the cluster. We're not going to have some SAN over on the side. We're actually going to stripe the data set across the, the local disks of the cluster computers. So the first thing we're going to do is to partition it, in this case, into eight parts. Um, and then <coughs> we're going to store those parts on the uh, cluster computers. And one thing I want you to notice here is I drew more parts than there are computers. So um, don't think of this as trying to exactly size your computation for the number of computers that you know are in the cluster. It's a shared cluster. The number of resources that you get during the actual runtime may vary. So think about just over, over um, partitioning to break the computation into smaller units. So that, that's what you're, you're extracting parallelism by breaking things into small units. You're not trying to exactly divide up the computation for the number of resources that you believe you have. Um, so then. Uh, if you're doing something like a select that takes a collection to a new collection, um, what's actually going to happen is you're going to start out with all of these partitions on the cluster computers. And <coughs> uh, it's going to start running the select on, a sub, uh, on each of these subsets individually, because select is com completely independent of the things that happen to each, uh, each element. Um, so each of the computers gets to start in parallel. And then as they finish their part, the, of their part of the data set, they can start the next one that they have. Um, and eventually, all of them will get computed one after the other um, in parallel across the cluster. Uh, and so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to show these types of programs more abstractly as graphs. And so um, something like this that was going from uh, a collection to another collection, uh, you can write it as going from each part to the, the next part. Um, and I'm going to write the, 
the computation that happens as its own node in this graph. Um, and then Yes. Uh, for simplicity, let's assume you bought a homogeneous cluster. In principle, it could, and and I'll talk a little bit later about Dryad, which is the system that actually does the execution. That th there's underlying fabric that's in charge of deciding what to run where and trying to put things in the right place, and, and I'm not going to talk about that yet. So this is all just the, the more abstract, how you con construct the parallel execution plan for the program that you want to run. And we'll worry about the data skew and, and heterogeneity and stuff later. Uh, so, so for simplicity of drawing slides, you know, then I take off all of the, uh, the labels, and you just end up with, with these, this type of this directed acyclic graph where you're starting with some data that's been split into parts, and you're applying some computation to each part independently, um, and then you're ending up with some output. Uh, so all of the Dryad and Dryad link computations get represented as these directed acyclic graphs. And the graph indicates the parallelism in the program via the independence, because each computation only reads and writes along its, it reads along its input edges, and it writes along its output edges. And so there's no other communication between the computations at all in the system. And so any two vertices that don't have an edge between them can be computed independently. Uh, so the goals of the dry link system, given the program that you wrote with these link statements, is it's going to try and extract parallelism in the first place. It's going to try and find independent computations that can be executed that don't interact. Um, it's going to try and help you to control data skew and balance the work that gets done across the nodes. Um, that's useful both for throughput so that you get more parallelism because you're doing an equal amount of work on each computer. Uh, it can also be very important um, for computations that uh, require state um, that you don't exhaust the memory in any one of the, the computers. So you need to control skew that way. Um, and the other goal that it has is trying to limit the amount of data that's transferred between computers. We're assuming that the network is going to be a bottleneck if you're not careful. So wherever possible, you want to try and reduce communication and do work locally on the computer where the data already is. Um, so you'll see as I go through some of these operators ways in which the system is trying to, to achieve each of these goals. Um, so let's start out with group by. Um, well, we kind of started out with select, but that was absolutely the simplest thing because select is select or, or equivalently where um, everything is completely independent and, and the graph is very simple. You just take the in input parts, operate on each one independently, and write the output parts. So then the next most complicated thing that you could do is group by. Uh, so set is some collection of records, each that has a key. Um, and we're going to want to form them into groups. So everything with the same key is going to end up in the same group. And in fact, the way that we implement it, everything in the same group needs to end up on the same computer, because you assume that you're going to do something afterwards with that group, and you're going to want them all to be in the same place. So, um, so the goal of this thing is going to be to reorganize the data so that everything with the same key ends up in the same place. And the kind of issue that you might have is you don't know what keys are present in the set before you start, and, and you don't know which parts they live in in the, in the partitioning anyway. Um, so the first thing you're going to do is to reshuffle everything so that everything with the same key is at least on the same computer. And then you can do locally that grouping to actually find within the, the set of things um, you can reorganize in parallel on the computers to find the actual <coughs> groups once you've shuffled everything around. So here's a picture of that graph to do that. So you start out with your set with four parts. Um, and the first thing you're going to do is do some hash partitioning by the key um, that just, in, in this case, we're going to uh, just generate two different parts for the, the new partitioning. So things that have an even hash are going to go here, and things that have an odd hash are going to go here. Um, and then once you've got all the things with an even hash here in whatever order, you can do a local grouping. Um, to get the, the final answer of these groups. So what you're going to end up at, with at the end is um, 
your groups will be split into two parts, and all the things with the even key will be here, and all the things with the odd, the odd key will be there. And so this is where, uh, for example, um, there's going to be no guarantee on the ordering that these groups come out. If you then enumerate over all of these groups using some subsequent computation, uh, depending on what hash function we chose, you're going to get some arbitrary ordering. So here, here the, this thing is really producing a set. It's not producing a sequence. Um, and if you want to order them, you're going to have to explicitly go and order them in a subsequent computation, the kind of which I will show. Question? What is happening in stage two of What is different from the other? So these are data and these are computations. Um, the, so the question was, what's the difference between the yellow nodes and the blue nodes? Um, and the, uh, these are the data set that you start with and that you finish with. And these are computations. And I'm kind of, so in fact, these may be the output of some previous, these may be computations that are some previous stage is. I, I'm going to be sort of. Uh, go back and forth between whether it's, it's uh, a computation or a data. Think of this as a computation that's reading a part off the disk. And this is a computation that's, that's uh, modifying that part in some way. One more question. So uh, in the third row, yes. there are two circles, right? Yes. So think about them as two machines. Each one of them will have several groups. Is that how we should think about yeah. it? So the, uh, let me go through a work example and then, then um, maybe you can ask the question again if it wasn't clear. So suppose that our data set actually started out with eight records, two in each part, and here are the keys of those records. Um, so th this first stage is going to happen in parallel, but I'm going to show it sequentially just for it to, to try and make it easier to understand. So the first part is going to look at the records in its part and <coughs> compute the the hash of each key, um, and in this case, I say that A and C both hash to, to the even side, and so these will both get, get written down that edge. And at the same time in parallel, this guy looks at its, uh, its records and finds that A hashes over here and D hashes over here, so it writes A and D down its output edges. Um, again, this guy writes D and B this way, B and A get written this way. So in parallel, all of, all of these uh, all of these computations run and, and just compute the hash part, hashes of each key and send them down the appropriate edge. Then each of these is going to start up and it, it has this unsorted list of keys and this has this unsorted list of keys and then in parallel those two are going to do local grouping and end up with those groups and then write them out. All in MIMD, All the implementation is in MIMD? Yes. The, so the implementation is MIMD was the question, multiple instruction, multiple data. Well, it's kind of more like SIMD. It's single, single function, multiple data. It's not single instruction, but it's single. That um, Within one of these horizontal lines, they're all doing the same function. Uh, <clears throat> OK, so uh, did that answer your question? Yes. So you shouldn't necessarily think of these as being two computers. If there were only one free computer on the cluster, this would execute on that and then this would execute on that. It, so they're two independent computations. And if you're lucky and you've bought enough computers, they will be two computers running in parallel. I have a question. So you decide partition to even the odds. You did that, not the program, right? So uh, we'll come to this a little bit later. So the number of parts here was determined by something upstream, possibly the way that you laid out the data set on the cluster in the first place. When the system does a reorganization like this, um, by default, the system will use some intelligence to look at how large this is going to be and choose an appropriate number of parts. Um, but that can be manually overridden if you don't think it's doing a good job. Yes. Yes. Well, so the final stage is still, they haven't been combined. This is living on the disk of one computer, and this is living on the disk of another computer. But we think of it as a collection, just the way we, this, this was spread over four computers, but we thought of it as a single collection. So what's the difference the Oh, th there is no difference. This is just writing it out to the final result. Sorry. So the, the point was that th this is now, 
this is the actual end result collection called groups, and this was a computational. So that's just a, my graph is not very clear. Question back here, yeah. Yes, so it's a question about load balancing and how to pick the hash. So, so I, I'm actually going to just uh, punt that a lot of the, the talks that uh, Dennis, the, the subjects that Dennis and Frank are going to talk about is practical problems when you have data skew and the, the automatic hash function is not working, what you do about things like that. Um, but yes, absolutely, that can be a problem and somebody is going to have to, to fix it. What is the basis? Where, where so, you mm -hmm. No, in the it was taken care of in this hash partitioning. You th these guys made sure that all the B's went over here and all the A's went over here. That was the point of that stage. What is the basis for grouping from the hash partition? How do you do that? Uh, is it based on framework? Well, so. so the programmer specified the key selector, and so this is just going to find all of the things with the same key. I mean, so you might do this by a sort if you happen to have a uh, an, or, an ordering on the keys, or or. Why can't it be three A's and two B's on two two B's and a C? Well, in the input data set, there were three A's, so that's that's what's ended up here. You've grouped them together. OK, so uh, for now, that's all I'm going to say about grouping, although it's going to come back uh, later. Um, but let's move on to, to sorting a large data set. We had a question about that earlier. Um, so this maybe looks like a surprisingly complicated uh, program that you have to run to sort. So I'll just go through what's actually happening here. So here again, you have some collection that is distributed, in this case, in four parts across the cluster. And we want to order by some key. <coughs> Um, and so, again, the goal is going to be to extract parallelism first. So what we're going to want to do is to, so each of these parts has some random distribution of keys. And what we're going to try and, try and do is make uh, two distributions where each of them has about the, two, two parts where each of them has about the same, a range of keys with about the, st the same number of elements in them so that we can sort those in parallel and have them take around the same amount of time. So we're trying to extract parallelism. Um, so the, the, the way the sort's going to work is, is first basically bucket sort into ranges and then locally sort each of those ranges. Um, and the reason for all of this complicated bit in the middle is that <coughs> we don't know the distribution of keys in the data set. And so um, <coughs> if we just pick some ranges a priori, we'll probably get it wrong, and then you'll get terrible data skew, and one of these will exhaust memory when it's trying to sort. I mean, imagine that there are actually 400 of these. Um, you want to get a nice even distribution. So, <coughs> so my, my example data set does indeed have very unbalanced ranges. So it has four ones, a two, a three, and a four, and a hundred. So, <coughs> so what you'd like to do is end up with all of the ones on one side and the rest of them on the other side. I mean, you know, in order to keep the number of things on the slide, I've kept this artificially small, but you get the idea that you may have unbalanced ranges and you want to try and, and figure that out before you do the range partition. <coughs> so the first thing that we're going to do is to read each of these parts and sample. Um, so in this case, I'm just sending one of the things forward. Imagine with these, you might send 0.1% of the data set forward or something. So we're, we're going to assume that if we do a random sample of this part, we're going to get a fairly good uh, estimate uh, of the, uh, of the range of keys that lies within this part. And so we're going to, in parallel, um, sample that, these down to a small amount. And then we're going to send them all to a single bottleneck that takes, in, the, in this case, in my example, would have been 1,000th of the data set all into one place, and then computes a histogram of those sampled keys. And so the, uh, the hope is that if you just look at those randomly sampled keys and you compute that histogram, that will give you reasonably well-balanced ranges. And so in this case, let's pretend it did exactly the right thing and came out with one range that is just the value 1 and the other range that's the value 2 through 100. 
So now that we've computed this in a single, single location, we can broadcast it out to all of these guys. And so now each of these computations sees its input part and the set of ranges that were computed using the sampling. And now it knows to send the one down this arrow and the 100 down this arrow. This one knows to send both ones down that direction. The two and the three both go over here. The four goes here and the one goes here. So based on this, this arrow communicates this histogram to each of these range partitioners. And they also read one part each. And with that combination of information, they can then do this reshuffling of the data that ends up with balanced ranges. So each of these guys now has an approximately equal number of keys that we can then sort locally efficiently um, and write out the output again. Yes? So we consider this uh, two nodes, the sort, and the range partition as two different nodes. Yes. Uh, so is it essential that if suppose the sort locally nodes are not available, then uh, like you said that 10 is sent and then 1 is sent. Right? Yes. So if those nodes are not available, will, go that, will the data be written into a file? Right, so the, the question is what, it's about sort of virtualizing the resources. If these processes aren't running and this tries to write on an edge, what's going to happen? And in, indeed, you guessed right, uh, they will write to a file. And I'm going to talk about that a bit later about how the. Any, any partitioning, yes. In, in fact, it's true for all of the edges secretly. Well, I'm going to talk about that later. Um, yes, question. So th there's a process will start off on one of the computers that reads in the sampled values from each of the. So this is going to read in a sampled subset of the entire data set all into one place. So will that not uh, be a module? Well, it will, but that was the point of sampling is to. Um, so, so you can look at the size. You know before you start how many, <coughs> how large this entire data set is. And remember, you're only sending the key, not the whole record. Um, so you know the, the, the system knows the types of these records. It knows the size of the key. It knows the number of keys. It can pick a sampling level such that um, this is, is not going to overflow. What is the notation? Uh, the, the question is, what's this notation? And this is just how I'm writing ranges. Oh, so the first one is the key, and the second one is the count. No, no, no. This is a range of keys from 1 to 1, and this is a range of keys from 2 to 100. Oh, that's the partition that has been done based on the histogram. Yes, exactly. <coughs> and th yes, so this is, this is 1 to 1, and this is 2 to 100. Uh, what do they detect errors from the first and the third level? Yes, so the, the point is that this guy needs to read the entire part and also the partitioning that was computed here, the range partitioning. And so it reads all of these data. So all of these data are going to be read twice, essentially. Once to sample them, and a second time to actually partition them. In principle, this might be optimized out, but logically it's read twice. Once by this computation and once by this computation. Uh, the sampling uh, scans through the entire data set? Yes. The sampling scans through the entire data set was the question. But it does it in parallel. Yes. In the in the in these partitions. Yes. So the question is, what happens if this thing computes imbalanced partitions? Yeah. And, and so if it does that, then you were unlucky in the, because the sampling didn't work right. If you, if you have unbiased sampling and you don't get unlucky, then this thing will not compute unbalanced partitions. And so it's possible that it can fail, and you do get unbalanced partitions. And then the programmer will have to come in and, and tweak things manually. In that case, your job will probably run out of memory in one of these sorts, and it will fail, and then you'll go debug it, is what will actually happen. <laughs> um, but remember that the number of par parts here is going to be hundreds or thousands. 
And the number of records this thing is going to read is probably billions. So you have to construct a fairly pathological case for it to really mess up. But an adversary that knows the sampling function could easily fool it, yes. So besides the number of doing this, how do I decide that I'm going to partition? Well, that was exactly the same question as the, as the number of hash partitions in the previous one. And the answer is the system does it trying to be clever by knowing the size of the total size of the data set. And if it gets it wrong, the user can manually override it. I don't think so. You on? You can't override the sampling function in the API, can you? No. It, in principle, one could expose that. We've never had any request for that, I don't think. That is because if I know what kind of data I have, probably I can do a better job of identifying the proper sampling. It's a uniform random sampler. If, so, I mean, if you know the type of data, you can, you can supply the ranges yourself. So you can write your own program to sample and compute the ranges and, and not use order by. You can just write a more complicated program if you want that. I mean, the other, the, the other secret guilty truth about order by is that people don't sort very often. Um, which is also partly why we don't get that many questions about it. Yep. So this uh, reviewing histogram is uh, something that might uh, be the unbalanced situation where you want to find the schools in the number of all the schools that they're skewed. Why, why do you say that it will be unbalanced if they're skewed? If one, if one key is much, yes. In that case, um, well, so technically, sorting is easy then, because you don't have to sort the thing if there's only one, one key there. I, I don't think the system actually detects that case, but that would, be the right, that would be the answer, is to end up with some hybrid where you were just bucket sorting. And then if you have a secondary key that you care about that, then the problem goes away. So it's only if, they, if you actually have a very large number of identical things, and then this, this local sort is a no-op anyway. That's right. And in the fourth level, those nodes they will be storing the data within those nodes. So this this will stream through all of the inputs and apply the range. And so as it streams each thing, it will look at the look it up in the range and decide which edge to write it down as a streaming computation. When you are computing the histogram, you have the knowledge that how many nodes are there at the yes. If you had distinct numbers, then 50 of them would go in the bottom range and 50 would go in the top range. Yes. 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 You have the histogram information. Now you have to order the groups that you five groups. So you will need the information that you find is So there requires some complexity computation. So the histogram computer only operates on a small subset of the input set. It may have to do a sort of that subset, but it's only a small subset, so we decide we don't mind paying the cost of doing that sort. Because each of these also has to sort a subset. You're going to have to do some sorts at some point. Well, these are all, in principle, on different computers. So somehow you have to reorganize the data before you can do the sort locally. You, you, could, you could combine these two. You, you do need this reorganization step. You need to get all of the ones onto the same computer before you can do the sort locally. And they didn't start out on the same computer. So at some point, you are going to have to do a, a reorganization that sends all the ones to one place and all the other guys to another place. <laughs>
And whether or not you can combine these two into the same process is an optimization that I'm not dealing with here. This is just a logical computation graph. OK, so, um, so those, those were the, the simpler cases. And now I'm going to go on to a more complicated optimization. Uh, this is actually the last one I'm going to go into in detail. Um, uh, but yes, we'll see if there are any more questions at the end of that. So the, we're now, we have a slightly more complicated program at the top now. And, and uh, remember that, uh, as Yuan said, link does lazy optimization. So when you run your link program, it starts with the set. It sees a group by. It doesn't actually do anything when it sees group by. It just, it just adds a group by node to some syntax tree. And then it sees a select, and it adds that to the AST. And then it's only when you actually try and get the result. It sees the whole computation at once. And so it can do op optimizations uh, that move things around relative to these. It doesn't just have to do group by and stop, and then do select and stop. And so that's, that's what we're going to see here. So this syntax isn't exactly correct, but I wanted it to fit on the line. Um, basically, what we're doing here is we start out with some set, and we're going to group it by some key. And then we're going to apply select to the output of group by. So what that means is select is going to run a function on each group individually. And the function that's going to run is find the key of the group and count the number of members in the group. So this is going to compute a histogram. Um, so for each, each unique key in the set, we're going to end up with an element at the end that has that key and the number of times the key appeared. And so the, the naive way to do it, based on what I told you, how I told you to do group by in the previous slide, uh, is shown here. So you would start out with some set. There are, there are a few more things in there now. Um, and we would do a hash partition as before. So all the, um, the C's have disappeared, but all the A's have ended up over here, and all the B's and D's have ended up over here. Um, and then we do the local grouping, so we end up with six A's here, six B's and four D's here. And so this was the group by that we saw before. Um, and then we would, in, in this select, we would go through each of the groups in turn and count the number of things there and end up with an A comma six here, B comma six and D comma four here, and then we have the output. So that would be a correct way of running the program. Um, but it's much less efficient than it could be for a couple of reasons. So one is that when we said group by, we, we said we wanted, what the programmer actually said was group this data set by records. And so what the system has gone and done here is it's actually sent all of the records across the network um, in order to be uh, repartitioned and then regrouped here. Um, and so first of all, if we'd looked a little bit further, what we'd, we'd have found out that we only cared about the key. And the record could have been huge compared to the key. Um, so we didn't really need to send the records at all. We wanted to know was the number of keys. And the second thing is that, um, again, we've wasted network transfer by sending uh, two copies of A from here to here, when all we were going to do was count them later. And we've also, in principle, got data skew that is exhausted memory, as we discussed before. If one of these A's occurs you know, a bazillion times, then this group locally um, is going to be very expensive for no particular reason. So uh, the way that you would manually try to optimize this and the way that the system automatically optimizes it for you is to add another stage up here to do a local grouping before we do any of the network transfer. So what it's going to do, it starts out with the set again. But since it's looked forward in the computation to see the thing that you actually care about, it can hoist this count all the way up to the front before you even start doing the group by. And so the first thing it does is on each local part in, in parallel, it first does a count. And then when you do the hash partition, all you're going to do is send the summary the one key and the number of times it appeared here. So the amount of data that you're transferring here is now proportional to the number of unique keys, not the number of records. And it's proportional to the size of the key, not the size of the record as well. Um, so in many cases, and some of the ones that uh, Frank and Dennis will be showing you, um, this is absolutely key to getting the thing to run at any reasonable uh, speed. Uh, and then so once you've got these things grouped locally, um, then 
instead of doing a count here, you do something slightly different. You're, you're, instead of having six A's, you have three A comma twos. Um, so you run a slightly different function to combine those together, but either way you end up with the same thing, which is six A's here, six B's and four D's over there. And so this is the real advantage of hoisting up the computation that you wanted to do to this high level declarative specification instead of manually writing a group followed by a select is that the system can look at this and it can synthesize this combiner function and it can automatically hoist this and it can do all of this without you having to do anything special at all. All it had to know was the way to turn count into a um, initial count and a combination and um, because of the, the semantics of count, it automatically knew how to do that. And if it had been a user-defined function, we could have given you an annotation so that you, it would have known how to do that. Question? Do we have any uh, more than the cluster with the computation of the node? It doesn't have any data. Uh, data no. All, uh, it, so the question is, are there any compute-only nodes in the cluster? For the clusters that we use, typically, no, they all have disk on them. Uh, that's not my question. Okay. Uh, when you write the data in Yes. Uh, it might be spread in such a way. For my particular computation here, yes. uh, a node does not have any data currently. So will that be used as a computation only node? Um, it, it can, yes. If, if the scheduler decides that the best use of cluster resources is to transfer that data across the network, it will do that. It, won't, it won't, doesn't have to run on the node where the data was. And, and that's important for things like this, where there is no node where all the data resides. Before it starts. Uh, there are the most commonly if the set of operations are similar like this. And, uh, well, so this hash partitioning is doing a reorganization. So it's actually doing a uh, data reorganization. Yes, that's what all of these arrows are showing is that is all of the data actually being shuffled between and the computers the and rewritten. Is it restored back to the original state or it's all functional. It doesn't affect the original data set. So set is unchanged by this statement. So the original data set remains where it was. Um, and if you want to reshuffle it, you would compute a new set. And then if you just drop the reference to this, it will get garbage collected. Original data set is not on. Correct. Um, yes, you can, only, uh, you can only update by replacement. There's no updates. In the, it's, a, it's purely functional programming model. OK, so that's all I have slides about for generating parallel plans. Um, and I was going to talk a bit about how the execution actually happens. But if you have more questions about parallel plans, um, there, there's a lot more detail of this is going to come up in the, in the next two talks with specific applications in mind. Um, yes, another question. Uh, we have uh, discussed so far about uh, data being in distributed systems and uh, uh, basic computation is happening, happening in such a way that every individual node of data is uh, processed in one particular uh, node of the cluster. Right? Yes. In, in a particular cluster itself, do, do we have some kind of a, a special parallelization that makes it of the capabilities of that particular node? To use multiple multiple cores uh, yeah, within. Yeah, cores, say, yeah. Yes. The system. So e each of these sub computations um, is executed by the system in parallel um, using code that Yuan wrote automatically. Um, yes, question. Uh, so can a user-defined function be recursive? Um, yes. What, but what, what were you really asking? Yes, it can. <laughs> oh, can a computation be, recur be what, iterative or recursive or? Yes. It's this within a select. So within a select, um, the parallelization happens with function applications per element. So you will apply a recursive application of your function on one thread to one element and on another thread to another element. So um, the, the 
your function itself is not parallelized. It's the application of your function to multiple elements that are, that are executed in parallel. So if you have a user-defined function in, inside here, you know, your user-defined function will be executed many times in parallel, one, once per element. Yes. 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 So, uh, so, so suppose there are just two things in the collection, then it will run fact in parallel twice, once on each of the elements. That, that, whether it's recursive or not, that's the only way that it's going to parallelize it. The, the only parallelism is it, it extracts is the executing on multiple elements at the same time. It's not within your user-defined function. Y your user-defined function remains sequential. Sorry. Yes. Well, not link does not have an update operator. Um, so uh, w one thing we haven't talked about is your user defined function inside of select could have side effects on some shared object. And if you write that program, you will just get undefined results. Nobody will catch it. It, it, it should throw an exception if you do that, but we haven't done that static analysis. Um, so, but in terms of the actual link expression, is always functional. So if you say var set equals set dot group by, then all you're doing is, is renaming. You're not actually doing update. Yes. Uh, I think I'll, so the question was, if you have some iterative computation and there's a where in it, and so the data is reducing over and over again, uh, who is going to redistribute it? Um, so I, I will leave that to the, the applications that have come up later where people actually do this. You'll see what, uh, what they do. The, the answer is nothing will happen automatically, but there are manual tools for, the, if your computation includes some uh, implicit data reorganization, as for example this does, then the system will estimate the data sizes, and so the system will actually end up uh, reorganizing it implicitly during these. But if you just had an iterative select, um, you would, or an iterative where and nothing else, then these, you would, the, the graph would just be straight line and the number of partitions would remain constant and some of them would become empty. So uh, within a program, the system maintains attributes of the collection so it knows if they're half partitioned or sorted. And when you store them to the distributed file system, they're stored along with metadata. And if you've just done a data load and you happen to know, then there are annotation, then there are um, operators you can use to, in, to tell the system that it already has some property like that. Okay, so... Uh, now I'm just going to say a little bit about the actual execution engine underneath that takes these abstract directed acyclic graphs and executes them on the cluster. And actually we've, we've covered most of this in answers to questions already. Um, but th the role that Dryad is playing in the system is to abstract away the cluster resources, so the number of computers, their names, the network topology, all that kind of thing. And it's to, to schedule this DAG, it's to decide which computer each of these vertices should be run on um, and this is in a shared cluster, so it has to, to um, uh, balance the needs of all the jobs that are running, and you know, if one job is running and taking up the whole cluster because it's the only job running and another job starts, it has to reclaim resources from the first job, um, and it tries to, to keep fair allocations between the different jobs that are running on the cluster. But it, at, at the same time, it tries to 
make sure as much as possible that it runs a computation close to the bulk of its input data, bearing in mind the network topology. So if you have a hierarchical network, you will, it will try to run things within the same rack um, as well as just on the same local machine. And so it, it balances these competing uh, constraints. Um, and it handles all the fault tolerance. Um, so if there's a transient failure of a computer or, or a network link, um, then you can just rerun one of the computations. Um, and if one of them, if in one of these horizontal uh, bars of equivalent computations, you can compute statistics on how long you expect them to take because you're running hundreds or thousands of them. And so if you detect that some of them are outliers, um, it will speculate and run a, another copy of that somewhere else um, to try and, and correct for. Basically, slow computations usually happen because one of the computers is wedged for some reason. You know, Microsoft IT is scanning the disk or something. Uh, and so rerunning it somewhere else frequently helps with that. Um, certainly, if it's because of data skew, um, it's not going to help. It's just going to run just as slow the second time. But um, this, this is often useful um, in practical clusters. Uh, and this has come up a few times, but I just want to say it again. Um, the big difference between the Dryad clusters and something like an MPI cluster that you may be used to from high performance computing workloads um, is that the resources are virtualized. As I said at the beginning, you don't think about owning all of the computers owning some set of computers for this, the, the duration of the job and, and curving up exactly to fit those set of computers that you've been given. The whole cluster is a shared resource um, for the whole time that your job is running. Some of the time that your job is running, you may be using all of the computers in the cluster. Some of the time, you may only be using one or two. That grows and shrinks. The exact computers you're using change throughout the portion of the job as it tries to, to compute close to the data. So if two jobs are each running on a data set that is spread over the whole cluster, they'll take turns using the computers so that they can each uh, use the local ones. Can you ask you something about uh, lower heads you pay for a part or in the hundred and hundred and that cluster? What about additional lower heads that you pay? So the overhead for fault tolerance was the question. The overhead for fault tolerance is actually subsumed in the overhead for virtualization. So the answer to the previous question about um, uh, whether um, what happens if the downstream vertices are not running when the upstream vertices are, are producing data. Um, in order to not worry about that at all, we write all of the intermediate results, all of those arrows are written to disk. And as a result, because it's a DAG, <coughs> you can execute the entire computation even if you only have one computer because there is a total ordering on the, on the graph and now all of the intermediate results are written to disk. So you never have any dependency where two vertices have to be running at the same time. And once you have done that, then fault tolerance comes for free because every computation is reading from inputs that have already been written. So if there are no failures, you pay nothing for fault tolerance because you do exactly the same thing you would have done otherwise. Um, but it does, uh, there are cases where you could have overlapped the computation of two vertices and directly streamed across the network instead of writing the intermediate data to disk. Um, and that would have made the fault tolerance more complicated and it would have made the, the scheduling for virtualization more complicated. Um, and Dryad can in fact do that, but uh, it's a manual switch to enable that and Dryad Link doesn't make use of it because we haven't really got to the bottom of um, the best way to schedule it. We kept the simple thing. Um, so it's also the case that um, disks are quite fast compared to networks in the kinds of cluster that we have. We tend to have four drives per computer and a gigabit ethernet. Um, so the overhead of writing to disk is not that much. Um, certainly if we did cut through, it would fall even more, we don't. So that's an obvious optimization that we could do. Um, when we go to 10 giggy, it may start to be more of an issue. That we may be leaving more performance on the table. The only option today is that everything writes to disk. In the future, we may provide an option once we've, we've 
once we understand how to do it better. But today, everything is always fault tolerant. Um, yeah. These clusters, what we uh, talk about with uh, these trends, uh, are they built up out of commodity hardware or is it really uh, from standard? Uh, commodity hardware. So we use commodity server hardware, um, but it's still commodity. You know, a couple of thousand dollars. A, we pay a couple of thousand dollars a box. I understand it's a bit more expensive here. And, and the story is around the local distribution. Yes. Uh, Correct. Um, so again, we've basically been through this in the questions, but uh, what controls the degree of parallelism? At the very beginning of your job, it's dictated by the number of parts in your input sets. So if you start with a select, for example, that will just run one process per part in your input set. Um, but then after one of these data reorganizations, the system um, will try to make a sensible decision about the number of parts to use based on the, the information it has from the type system about the likely amount of data reduction, for example. Um, and if you, as the user, feel that it's got it wrong, um, there are manual overrides um, to, to select the degree, the number of parts in intermediate data sets. Um, so yes. Yes, here they are about to come up. OK. Uh, so there are some additional link operators that we've put into Dryad Link. And I'm going to say a little bit about a few of them. And then there's a bunch more that are in the user manual that I'm not going to talk about. So um, the, the key ones are, are the ones that let you actually address distributed collections that live in the distributed file system. And so um, the first one is partition table dot get. Um, with the type of the record that lives in the partition table and the URI that specifies the, the, the stream name in the distributed file system. And this is how you get an input that you can start computing on. Um, and then the, uh, the matching one to write one out at the end is to partition table that emits the, the output of your computation. Um, and then there are some operators to, uh, to control the partitioning of these things. Um, and so uh, you know, as we've discussed, the system sometimes automatically does hash partitions. You can manually specify a hash function and a number of parts. If you want to manually reorganize your data, you can do this with ranges as well. Um, and this is when you, you loaded some data in, and you know how it was partitioned, but the system doesn't. You can tell it using this, and then subsequent parts of the computation will take advantage of that knowledge. And if you lied there, you'll get the wrong answer. Um, it doesn't check. Uh, and then there are annotations that you can add to functions. So if you remember that, um, that group by followed by count that we had before, um, the reason that, it was, uh, that the answer was correct when you hoisted the count up to the, the beginning was that um, addition is associative. And so it didn't matter that you were adding all these things up in the wrong order um, and then combining them later. Uh, and so if you have a user-defined function, in general, the system cannot assume that it's associative. And so it would have to, um, if you do an aggregate with a user-defined function, the system will actually do the thing that Yuan said, which is use each record in turn, one after the other, um, in, the, in the specific order of the sequence. Um, so you can put an annotation on saying, no, actually, it's associative. And then it will apply the optimizations and can do the parallel aggregation. Um, and then oh, in gray that you can't see are, are a whole bunch of other, um, it's on my screen, uh, are a whole bunch of other uh, operators that I'm not going to talk about that, that are in the user manual. Um, so uh, now I'm just going to go through. This is an entire program. It's one of the sample programs. So the first thing that you're going to do when we break into groups is to try and run this program on our cluster. So I'm, I'll, I'll just go through in some detail. It's very short. Um, so there's some C sharp mumble at the top that just you know finds all of the the libraries that you're going to use essentially. And then we have a program, and here's hardwired into it the name of some input set, which is uh, 
some strings that are going to be used in these sample programs. Um, and then the main program says, uh, make a collection called table that is instantiated from this input set. So this is now a logical collection that contains all of the strings in this data set. And then all we're going to do is write out the number of lines in the table. And so this table.count um, turns into a dried link program. When it sees that its input lives on the cluster over here, then it's going to go and it's going to compute a, a parallel plan to count each of the parts individually and then aggregate them in another part and then ship the one number back to your laptop and print it out. But all of the actual counting will have been done on the cluster. Um, and that's it. So in order, when you have a link expression like this, in order to trigger computation on the, on the cluster instead of on your local machine, um, the, all you do is tell it that the input lives on the cluster. Um, and after that, it decides that the right thing to do is to compute on the cluster. So this, so the partition table dot get takes a type. And in this case, it's a line record that means that there, that's a, a um, system defined type that is used for just strings. Um, if you were, so suppose that you wrote a program and it output some data, um, then you would have a collection, um, and so suppose your collection was of some user defined structure that had you know, two ints, a float, and a string. Then when you say to partition table at the end to write the results out, um, it will construct serialization code and write out those types using a custom serialization. And then if you use that later with the same user-defined struct, it will deserialize that for you. Um, if you have data that you loaded from somewhere else that has a custom serialization, then you can write your own deserializer. Um, and so essentially line record is a system-defined class that has a deserializer for lines. Um, so, you know, you can supply serialization, deserialization code to, to map to existing data sets. Yes? How uh, does So, here there isn't actually a master node. This, the, the result is coming back to your laptop. Um, the, but in general, if there are, it, Dryad has a scheduler that's looking at all of the jobs running on the cluster and is deciding what to run where. So if you have some node that aggregates everything, that will be chosen by the scheduler using the same constraint solver that, that anything else is chosen. Um, is it similar to the PC jobs? Uh, it is conceptually similar, it has different performance trade-offs. Um, and, and what about the programming? Uh, is it the same kind of programming that we do here? Like the, what, which job runs on which computer does it run? Uh, so the HPC scheduler model currently, um, the set of nodes that a job is allocated is slowly varying. In many jobs, it's completely fixed for the length of the job. It can, they can change, but it's, a, it's an expensive transaction in the HPC job scheduler to change that set of nodes. Whereas in Dryad, all of the jobs running on the same cluster are constantly making use of different computers. So the set is, is extremely, um, uh, uh, the, it, it changes from <coughs> moment to moment. And so the, this, so typically when you run a dryer job, you say, I'm using this cluster and I don't care which computers I'm going to use. You decide um, based on data locality which are the best computers to use. Okay, what kind of configuration do we need to do? Dennis is going to talk about that. What kind of configuration do you need to do for running dryer jobs in your HPC cluster? Yeah. The, Yes, the answer is not as simple as you'd expect, but yeah. Right, I mean, you, the, the high level, you know, the, the goals are slightly different. You really want to design systems that are have high throughput and, and aren't particularly latency sensitive. Whereas if you look at typical HPC clusters, they're really 
design for low latency. And so not, I mean, you, you get high throughput as part of that, but you may be making a trade off. For example, they might have one extremely fast disk and a few slower disks where you get you know, a greater accurate feedback. So you might have extremely high, you know, uh, extremely low latency network between, uh, where you pay, pay a lot of money for a low latency network. Quantity level networking with you know, more, more distance per system or per, per the, the, the other complexity to the question is that um, we developed Dryad on Microsoft internal cluster management software that is not the HPC cluster management software. And there's the external release of Dryad that runs on HPC that was done very much as a research prototype. And it does not have the smoothest interaction with HPC. And the HPC product group is going to release a product which will be better integrated with that. And there'll be a community technology preview soon for that. So the answer will be a little bit different from the academic prototype than it will be from the product. So going forward, the, uh, the scheduler Yes, going forward in the HPC product, product, it will all be one unified thing. Um, but not right now. That's the roadmap. So, would you like your There's a configuration file that says which cluster you're running on, actually, that you don't see here. Um, okay. I. Oh, oh. Oh, yes. So, as there was actually some questions to Yuan about this right at the very beginning. Um, that once you've run some link query, you had your array of ints, and then you did a um, dot select many, and you just had this um, I enumerable, and somebody asked, somebody said, well, you now have this array, and Yuan said, no, no, it's not an array, it's just a collection. Um, and that's even more true here. If you, if you start out with some set and then you end up with some answer, which is a collection, um, it's definitely some abstract type that is not an array in the memory of your computer in general. Um, and there's the two array method that you can run on any I enumerable that will materialize it into an array in the local memory of your machine that you can do further computation on. And if you do that to a terabyte data set, you'll probably be unhappy. But many computations end up computing a fairly small <laughs> summary that it would be nice to just do a two array on, um, and, and that is how you get the answer locally. Yeah. Um, OK, so now we're going to start off with the first um, practical session. Uh, and so we're going to ask you to all form into groups. And, um, we want to have nine groups, because there are nine logins. Um, and this is not technically true, but it's almost true that there's going to be one MSR member per group, right, anyway. Um, yeah. uh, and so there's going to be, most of tomorrow is going to be taken up with a uh, programming project that is uh, hopefully going to be aligned to your area of interest. And so um, if possible, we'd like the groups to align in such a way that people in the group will agree on what an interesting project would be. So. Um, if, so I know some of the people here are uh, practitioners and some of the people here are more sort of systems programming language people. So if we get the practitioners to act as nuclei for the groups, maybe we can agree on nine different subject areas and then people can go join those groups. Um, so, so, so um, I'll just, we'll do that in just a moment. Um, and I'll just leave this on the screen. Um, and I guess we'll email you these slides anyway. Uh, but uh, we're going to be having you run on cluster computers in Mountain View because that cluster is bigger than the one that you have here. And so we can run more jobs in parallel. Um, and so each of the groups is going to have one computer on our local network that you're logging into via remote desktop and actually running the programs on. And there, Sherwood-246 to 253 and Sherwood-255. 254 is not working. Um, 
And when you go to that, if you log into one of these computers and go to this path, this samples directory, there are three subdirectories, count, points, and robots. And each of those contains a solution file. So if you load the solution file in the count directory, that should be this dried link program. Um, and then there are some tools that um, we can help you use for uh, debugging um, and looking in the file system to see what files are available um, that are, at, again, these paths on these computers. Uh, so uh, we will all be available for helping you actually do this, but it, I figured it would be good to have this written down on a slide for you to have as a reference. Um, and I'll, yes, I'll email this to all of the nine group leaders so you don't have to have it written down. So um, in order to run on a cluster, you're going to need a Microsoft login. Um, so there's not a lot of point installing it on a laptop that's not on the corporate network. Going to log into a machine in California. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so we could have uh, the. <laughs>